Today marks the 48th anniversary of the Miami show band massacre. The show band scene in Northern Ireland really came to an end at that point when three members of one of Ireland's most loved bands were murdered by UVF paramilitaries and by members of the UDR. I mean, 48 years ago, it's a lifetime yep. ago. Yep. And you were one of just a couple of people lucky to survive. Yeah. Is the memory of that night still vivid for you? Oh, Pat, it's with me every day. I have got photographs of Fran and the guys in my bedroom and in my lounge. So it's with me 24 hours a day. I will I mean, never it, forget it. It was an ambush that was intended. The bomb was to be planted in the van of the Miami band. They would yep. then go south. The bomb was yep. timed to explode when the band would be already returning home. Right. It would explode and yep. then the band would be indicted posthumously yep. with the crime of being couriers of bomb materials for the IRA. Uh, right. That's well, it in, in yeah. a nutshell. Well, as you probably know at the time, the IRA was on a ceasefire. And at the time, one belief was that the British wanted to provoke the IRA to end the ceasefire so that the British could defeat them. The Miami massacre may have been planned to provoke a response from the IRA. So the mystery still kind of remains. Now, yep. you, you've also been reading some material which suggests that Robert Nyrek, who disappeared yes, um, and who was an undercover agent for the British and who masqueraded yep. as a Republican, yep. you were saying he could sing nationalist songs better than oh, the... Oh, apparently he knew the lyrics and he knew and he could sing it with feeling as well, all the songs he sang. It was unbelievable. Just heard about it on the train when I was coming down from Belfast this morning. They were talking about it. But I've seen documents which... Uh, uh, you see, all along the British have denied that Narek was involved. But my lawyer in Belfast, Michael Flanagan, has documents now which tell us that he was, it's in black and white, that Narek was involved in the Miami massacre. Now, I said it on the night of the massacre. I told, when I was asked for my, um, uh, what happened on the night, I told them it was a posh English accent. And they've always denied that Narek was there. And, um, you know, when, when we had the, uh, all the reports and everything that were done, the HET report, uh, which in the end said there was collusion, and uh, they always denied that Narek was there, and I know why. It would have been hugely embarrassing for the British government. Because if, he was a British agent, exactly, full stop. Exactly. And they wanted to put all the blame on the RUC and the UVF and the UDR. That's what their whole thing was. That it was a locally uh, hatched plot exactly. rather than a London hatch plot. Exactly. Um, will we ever get to the truth of this, Des, do you think? Well, I hope we do for the sake of uh, the families and everybody else concerned, Pat. I really do. Uh, I am currently writing my book with uh, a gentleman who you probably know very well, Ken Murray. Uh-huh. And Ken and I are writing my book, which is called My Saxophone Saved My Life, which it did. I wouldn't be sitting talking to you today if it wasn't for my saxophone. Now, people say, how come that is? Well, on the night of the massacre, you pointed out a while ago about the 10-pound bomb. When they said they were going to go to our van, I said, right, I would like to go to the van and take my saxophone out of the van. Now, I was standing next to where Narek was. In other words, there's five people standing in a line. There's the van, and there's where the the, uh, the 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 line ended. So instead of me going back to where I was in the line, I went, took my saxophone out of the van, put it on the road, and stood beside the van. What happened was when they put the bomb in the van, it exploded and it blew me over the ditch into the field below. So if I hadn't have gone back to get my saxophone. I would have been at the beginning of the line and I would have been mowed down. Yeah, because, yeah. I mean, the, after the uh, bomb went off, I mean, they shot everybody that they could find. It was it was all hell broke loose. Yeah. In the gunfire, the crying, the screaming, it was just, uh, it was unbelievable. And it, uh, I had to at one stage, I was lying down, face down in the grass, and I remember watching the GI war movies in Vietnam where they did exactly the same. Pretend you're dead, lie down in the grass. 
And that's exactly what I did. But because of the bomb uh, setting the van on fire, it set the ditch on fire. So the ditch was coming closer and closer to me. And I realized I have to get out of here. So I turned out and I called out Fran, Bran and Tony. I got no response. I called out Stephen's name. He was muttering. I told Stephen, I'm going for help. And I ran up and I didn't know if there's going to be guys up in the top of the road ready to shoot me down. And I ran up onto the main road. There was a lorry came along. I asked him for a lift into Newry Police Station. He refused to give it to me because he thought I, I might have been part of this whole atrocity. And what I saw on that main road, it was horrendous to say the least. But a young couple came along. They took me into Newry Police Station and I was able to get help. And Steve survived as well. And Stephen, Stephen got and nine spoke. inches taken off his bladder, but he survived. Yeah. Thank God. Well, look, Des, I look forward to talking to you when uh, the book is completed with yourself and Ken. Would love to, Pat, and thank you for the opportunity of talking to you. Uh, Des McAlee, also known as Des Lee in the Miami Show Band. Des, thank you very much for joining us in studio.